I'd like to welcome everybody to the pharmacy-based HIV testing, a conversation with ASP Cares Pharmacy Oklahoma. My name is Demetrius Mosley, and I'm a SEBA specialist for the Hand United Division of the Latino Commission on AIDS. Um, I'm really happy that everyone is able to be here today. So a little bit before we start, we'll begin with some housekeeping. So towards the end of this session, there will be a question and answer portion. So I want everyone to simply just use the raise your hand feature via Zoom, um, but also don't hesitate to ask questions throughout the session as well. You can simply pop those into the chat. So by the end of this webinar, um, we hope that participants will be able to increase their knowledge of pharmacy workflow, flow, excuse me, um, enhance their understanding of pharmacy's role in HIV prevention, specifically pharmacy-based HIV testing and self-testing, as well as increase their knowledge of pharmacy-based testing models, um, and ultimately increase their capacity to partner with pharmacists and pharmacies to implement pharmacy-based testing interventions. So we want to start by introducing our panelists. Um, we'll start off with Cher Golden, who is the community liaison for ASP Cares Pharmacy. Hello, Cher. Hi, how are you guys? <laughs> Doing great. Um, so just tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so I um, have had um, about 25 years experience in nonprofit leadership. Uh, the last most recent being with our large um, HIV and AIDS foundation, the Oklahoma AIDS Care Fund. And then um, in 2019, I started working for ASP Cares. So I transitioned from the nonprofit into more of the treatment and prevention side. And so I'm a community liaison here in Oklahoma City. We have one pharmacy, which is where you are today with us, um, in our one brick and mortar pharmacy in Oklahoma. And then we have, um, we're in uh, 10 different uh, states and 40 different cities across the country. Awesome. That's amazing. Um, next, we'll move in to Brent Williams, who is the pharmacist for ASP Cares. Hi, my name is Brent Williams. I'm the pharmacist in charge here at ASP Cares of Oklahoma City. Um, I've been working here this year, um, uh, basically uh, getting acquainted with the community. And, and uh, I've been working in, with uh, 340B and uh, things like that for the last 10 years. Uh, from school on, basically, uh, using just uh, transplants and uh, immunoglobin and things like that, which is very important with the HIV testing. And now it's moved on to uh, uh, HIV and uh, care and prep and things like that. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much, Brent, for the lovely introduction. And finally, we have Guillermo Martin Del Campo, who is the pharmacy technician. Yeah, so uh, my name is Guillermo. Uh, I've been working for ASP Cares for about five years now. I recently became a pharmacy technician. And uh, yeah, I mean, we help out patients uh, with any questions they have, uh, try to keep them up with their uh, medications and, and so on. Awesome. Thank you so much, everyone, again, for being able to join and allow us to have this space and have this conversation. So a little bit um, to kind of set the context. So the Southern United States continues to be disproportionately impacted by the HIV epidemic. Of the roughly 37,000 new HIV cases in 2019, close to 52% were in the South. The ending the HIV epidemic initiative pr promotes innovative community-driven solutions to expand HIV testing in urban and rural settings. So one key approach is collaborating with cross-sector partners to identify and implement easily accessible and acceptable services, such as self-testing and pharmacy-based HIV testing programs that can make knowing one's status simple and routine. The accessibility of pharmacies for HIV testing presents a unique opportunity for pharmacists and their staff to contribute to the identification of undiagnosed HIV. It's estimated that 70% of rural consumers live within 15 miles of a pharmacy, and 90% of urban consumers live within two miles of a pharmacy. So overall, pharmacies and retail clinics represent a vast, largely untapped potential for delivery of HIV testing in settings that are more accessible and for some people less stigmatizing than traditional testing. So given this context, we understand that pharmacies have the potential to be a rich resource for HIV testing. So let's first talk about what a pharmacy is. So for those of us who may not be familiar with the structure of how pharmacies work, can you give us a quick five to 10 minute crash course on the essential components of a pharmacy's workflow? Yeah, sure thing. Um, basically a prescriber will uh, send us a, a, a prescription either by consultation 
there'll be a refill request or it'll be just from a doctor's visit. Uh, from that visit, um, we'll get the prescription and we'll reach out to the customer and we have to ask them if they have any health insurance coverage. If they don't, then that's when we can uh, step in for assistance and then we ask them for some personal information. And so we do uh, all kinds of things. So we, we do the insurance part of it for them or we um, actually do the patient assistance for them if they don't have any insurance coverage, which is extremely important for this community because we want to make sure that everybody is covered. Um, we do have a really good approach with that. Uh, basically, they just have to give us a couple of, of pieces of information if they don't have coverage. And then we have actually a back end that we'll go through and uh, create the, um, the nece necessary codes that we need so we can get through that medication with very little cost. And most times it's at no cost. Um, then they can decide whether they wanted to pick it up or if it's too much for them to come to the pharmacy, we make sure to talk to them about the medications and then we either uh, make, deliver it to them uh, using a delivery service or they'll come in and talk to, it, to us personally. Usually the first time we wanna to talk to them on the phone uh, about their uh, medication, especially if they're positive. Uh, that's the thing that really takes adherence. We wanna make sure that the person's taking it every 30 days and they're taking it consistently. Uh, PrEP, it's, it's kind of the same thing. We want to make sure that they're taking it consistently also. So if they don't talk to us for a while, we make sure to call them. We have a, a calling system in place that Guillermo has uh, completely instituted. And basically what he does is he makes sure that you call them every day until uh, we get some sort of contact from them. If we don't, uh, we uh, try text messages. We also uh, even try physical letters uh, if, they, if they're not responding to us. And we kind of keep track of our patients that way. Um, after the 30 days, we, we make sure that uh, we get their refill scripts because uh, that's something that's very important for them. Also, if they know that they have a doctor's appointment coming up, we usually remind them of that also. Um, other than that, uh, Guillermo takes uh, care of most of the, the text messaging and the calling for the things like that. And he talks to those uh, patients that personally, and he knows most of them by name. Mm -hmm. He actually knows uh, where they are, what they're doing, uh, um, usually where they are during the day and if you should call them or not and when their lunch hours are. Um, most of our patients we know pretty intimately like that. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, is there anything you want to add to that, um, Guillermo? Well, I mean, uh, we try to keep up with them since, I mean, they're very, uh, you know, nice to us and, you know, we like to uh, compensate that, you know, being nice to them as well so they can keep up with their medications and, you know, they stay safe, safe as well. I've actually had a couple um, patients that have had to change, like maybe their insurance changed and they requires them to use a mail order service specifically for a specialty pharmacy and they've lost that. And so if I run into them, they're like, tell Guillermo I said hi. And I love that. <laughs> um, just to have that connection because I don't always feel like you get that in like a bigger chain, you know, stuff in a small town. Obviously, you can have those relationships with your pharmacist, um, but sometimes you can't. And that's one of the the major benefits, I think, of working with like ASB Cares and our partner pharmacies, um, because we are small enough to really do that one-on-one -on -one care with everybody. Yeah, that is absolutely amazing that you guys are able to offer that level of care and intimacy to the people that you serve. Um, so with that in mind, actually, um, I kind of want to turn to our participants. Um, so in one word, can you type within the chat as we continue throughout this, when you think of a pharmacy or your pharmacy experiences, what is one word that would describe that for you? So just drop those words into the chat and we'll continue on and we'll kind of address those as we move along throughout this, okay? So again, amazing customer service initially, what you guys offer. You're very in touch with who you serve, which is an amazing experience. So let's get more into pharmacy-based HIV testing. So tell us about your experience with pharmacy-based HIV testing. So there's two things you can do with the pharmacy-based HIV testing. Um, you can do the saliva test, and it's uh, order quick, things like that. Uh, within the first 90 days, it, it can kind of give you an idea of um, HIV, HIV status, uh, but it's not definitive. So anything between uh, day zero, uh, when you think, and then day 90, you're not going to get a, an absolute answer to that, but you will get some coverage to, to let you know that maybe some things are going on that you would need to get uh, further testing for, and that'll give you a heads up for it. Those kits are saliva-based. They work within 15 to 30 minutes. Um, if, you, if it is positive, there is false positives, so it's not always uh, 100%. 
if there's negatives, there's also false negatives. It's also not 100%. So it, it's one of those things that um, it can give you a heads up, kind of a blanket thing to make you uh, go from one point to another and kind of, it, it kind of gives you an idea of what's going on what, whenever um, you come into a pharmacy with that test. And we can tell you what you should do for your next step. So like that, that would be mostly what we would do for you is like if you came in and took the test and you knew within 15, 30 minutes, we, we've experienced it before, we, knew, we know what answers to give you. We, it's not always 100% uh, positive and we know to where to send you or give you information what to do next. So that, that's more than anything, that, that's when people really need that information, not just the positive result or the negative result, but what to do next, just in case. And one of the things that is um, difficult in the South, especially here in Oklahoma, um, our two metropolitan areas are very large and then everyone else is really spread out in rural communities. Um, and if you don't have the benefit of coming in and having a pharmacy like ours, where we really focus on um, HIV and PrEP and PEP, you might run into the fact where you know your pharmacist. And then it could be stigmatizing to ask for um, and purchase a home kit. And that might be something that could be very awkward conversations with, you know, yeah. your, um, sometimes it's a family member that works at the pharmacy that's the pharmacist. So you're asking your uncle um, or they know your parents. And then, and for young people, that is such a challenge and so stigmatizing. So not always is the pharmacy the best, um, you know, place to go, but it is nice to have those options for folks that do want to do either um, on-site uh, testing within the pharmacy or to have a kit that they take home. Absolutely. Awesome. We love that. So Brent, speaking back to, um, you pretty much said that individuals have the opportunity to engage in the testing within the pharmacy, and then you guys are able to direct them towards services. Um, are those services offered specifically within ASP Cares, or do you have partnerships? We have partnerships for that. Um, ASP Cares is just as a pharmacy component. So we have uh, several outreach uh, community clinics that they can go to and they can go to the, the one of their choice, basically. We just give them the ones that uh, are nearby and then the ones that we've dealt with. A lot of them are in programs with us that would help financially and things like that. And, and that's a lot of it where the relationship comes from. And then uh, we give them that information so they can go see that clinician. And it's really grown over the last three years. We're so lucky now that um, the CBOs have now started their own STI clinics. Um, we have a standalone new STI clinic that really work is, works um, not only with the, you know, the traditional LGBT community, they're doing a lot of trans services and um, hormones um, in that, and so they're full service, and then we um, also, as, as Brent says, works with some of the community health centers as well. A lot of those are part of our 340B program or contracted pharmacies for uh, their 340B programs and are able to order those discounted medications and then get them enrolled in the different um, assistance programs. So it, it's great because on their end um, with the CBOs and the ASOs, um, the the coverage for the visits and the lab visits and that they're using their 340B dollars to keep the doctor's visits and the labs costs down and really keep the out-of-pocket costs on the services side. And then we're able to help with the out-of-pocket um, costs on the, the actual prescription and medication. Oh, I love that. Okay, awesome. So speaking to what you guys say that you do um, in terms of testing, connecting to services and having those partnerships. Um, in doing so, have you experienced any challenges? And if so, how did you overcome them specifically um, as it relates to the relationship portion of connecting people who may have preliminary positives? There's a lot of fear with it. And that's, that's an, the one thing that you have to get past. And um, we, we see a lot of it every day and, and we know how to, to reach out and be able to talk to you about it. And so, it's not something that uh, you have to be afraid about. That's why we have such a good uh, phone system and text system and, and things like that. So after you get your initial contact with us, then we start talking to you. If you don't feel comfortable in the beginning, uh, we all always allow you to come back. We ask every time, do you wanna come pick up your medication? Do you wanna come in for a bit and talk to us about anything that you want to? And then once we form those relationships, they have friends or in the people in their community. And then they say that the ASP Cares is there for you because they, they did exactly that for me. And then maybe they can come back and, and then it, as it becomes more comfortable over time, people in the community get more comfortable with us over time. 
And we're able to really deliver and meet people where they are. So if I need to be a proxy for them and pick up on their behalf and meet them somewhere, um, if they're a transient couch homeless, homeless community, you know, is there a place that they regularly go to like a food pantry that can be, or a a homeless shelter that we can deliver to? Um, You know, do we need to deliver to the dorms? Um, Or is that a bad thing? Um, Because you have a roommate, you don't want anything delivered to the dorm room. So, you know, all of those type of things that we really look at on figuring out for them and making sure that we really take the confidentiality of this and the stigma. We definitely understand it. And we try to take um, as much control of that and assure people that it, it's going to be okay. Um, awesome. And just an FYI for our participants, um, there we're actually having this conversation in a pharmacy. So if someone has to step away, it's because the work never stops. So right. <laughs> again, so... That's kind of that's kind of exciting. So awesome. Speaking back to everything that you said, um, share about the potential of meeting people where they are and addressing fears that they may have related to stigma. Um, I kind of want to explore more about your role specifically at ASP Care. So what does that look like to be that liaison? Um, or is that a position that you think would be helpful or fruitful in trying to create these partnerships with pharmacy testing? Absolutely. Um, you know, because they, they're here every day, so they're not able to really go out into the community and market our services and connect the CBOs and the ASOs to what we do. So that's a big part of my role is educating, no, I've got to fly, um, that is educating, um, you know, the CBOs, the ASOs, the various clinics, doctor's offices, um, even the hospitals that were available. Um, we've recently started working with the case managers at um, our case management, the folks that have the Ryan White case management referrals are part of the state and they're actually part of the Department of Human Services and they're in adult protective services is the way it, it's just always been that way um, and so there's a handful of case managers and I've been able to go and do lunches with them and bring them up to speed on what we do and so n- now there's that when somebody leaves a hospital before they could get to see an actual provider there's some delays a lot of times in that, or if someone's coming out of um, the Department of Corrections and they're newly released, um, do they have to start all over again? And what kind of medications did they leave with and where are they in their process? And so we're able to work with the case managers now and figuring out um, are there transfers of existing prescriptions that we can take and and get them in while they're waiting on um, and actually seeing a provider, you know, just kind of working on all of those things. If somebody newly moves here and they're getting into the Ryan white program but everything hasn't transferred over you know are, can we work out with the out-of-state pharmacies and the out-of-state ryan white clinics to get those medications transferred over here and see what's going on um, so that the people are always staying in care and that's the biggest thing and a lot of long-term survivors they do not want to miss a dose and i don't blame them um, and so i think it's great that they have such a strong um, adherence to their medication and we want to keep that up for them it's important absolutely adherence is so important and keeping true with this. So um, as you guys stated about previously, I'm going back a little bit to about the way the testing is done in the pharmacy. Um, Do you guys sell um, any self-testing kits? Happy to order a quick testing kit, but uh, it just depends on our stock. It goes up and down. Uh, Mm -hmm. A lot of times we'll take a phone call, they'll ask us about it, but like it just depends on uh, interest and things like that. Okay. It's not extremely high um, for that. It's, um, I think we're kind of a, a secondary in, in that option. Um, and a lot of the CBOs that have started their clinics, they are already doing the CTR, the counseling testing and referral. It's just nice that now they can refer back into their own clinic. Um, whereas before we only had the Ryan White Clinic in Oklahoma. Um, and so it's nice that there's new options. Um, and so the word's getting around that we're all part of this bigger puzzle and everybody fits in differently. But it goes along with the national um, campaigns of test your way, which is great because now there's so many different options for how people can get tested. And we're just one part of that. Okay. Specifically to how you guys conduct testing, connect people to services. Are there any new or innovative approaches that you guys plan on implementing in the near future? Yeah, so actually we will be um, opening up a new pharmacy in one of our CBOs. Um, Guiding Right has New Hope Wellness Center and we'll be putting in um, a pharmacy inside the clinic. So folks will actually be able to get tested at the clinic, 
see a provider and then walk straight down the hall and get their prescriptions from us, which is amazing. But I've also set up um, and we've built in a space for a consult room because we know injectables is really coming down the pipeline. And so Cabinuva being one of the new injection drugs, um, those can be done either in the pharmacy setting or in the clinic setting. And those are monthly. And so sometimes it's not always easy for folks or you have to schedule another visit. So, you know, you come in and you do your visit for your labs and everything, but then you have to schedule another visit for the injection. And then, you know, it's going to be a bit of a clog and backlog on the providers. So we're one extra piece in that puzzle to um, keep things moving down the train um, and, sure. and down that path so they can come in and get the injections from us as well. Um, overall, as a state, Oklahoma, what is the what is the pharmacy-based testing landscape? Um, is this something new and never, never like seen before within the state, or is it something that people are gradually starting to navigate towards? Yeah, I think it's probably cutting edge. I think for things like uh, that, it, it, it's uh, not a lot of people know that you can do such things, and it's one of those things that you have to get out into the community and know. And I don't think there's a lot of knowledge of it right now. Yeah, it kind of varies, I think, from your networks and what your friends are doing. I mean, that's this community is very much relies on an ask and get their information as word of mouth. Um, so depending on you know who they ask, like, hey, where'd you get your last HIV test? That's gonna be the referral that you get um, more often than not. So, you know, trying to, to get the word out there. We do have one large testing walk-in center in Oklahoma, and it's actually our largest testing facility in the state. Um, and it's called Expressions Community Center. It's right on the strip in the LGBTQ uh, district with all of the LGBTQ bars. Um, and so they're open daily for just walk-in visits and have been, um, gosh, for, you know, almost 30 years now. So everyone, um, even outside of the LGBT community know that they actually do um, quite a few heterosexual um, testing as well and that everybody just knows where to go. Um, and, and so that's, that's been probably the largest place for testing. And then now you have so many different options for uh, confirmatory testing for treatment and starting PrEP. PrEP has been slow to start here in Oklahoma. When I started in 2019, I had a handful of friends that were taking PrEP. Um, the, it had a, its own stigma around it, um, even though PrEP has been around since 2012, you know, looking at you know, 2019, seven years later, um, a handful of people were on it and um, they got some backlash and for people saying that they were promiscuous if they were on prep and that was kind of the, the thought around it. And it, over the last three years, there's been a lot of conversations, a lot of help, um, especially with Gilead coming into the communities and running mainstream commercials on mainstream television and those things where you're really starting to see it and friends are really talking about it and um, knowing how safe it is to take and how effective it is has been a game changer. And so you're really starting to see that across the board. And I'm excited for, you know, kind of the future of prep. There's lots of new opportunities coming down the pipeline and I'm looking forward to seeing how that's really going to help with uh, ending the epidemic. Love it. Um, each one of you guys has hit on ultimately the role that pharmacy plays in HIV prevention. Uh, we've talked about pharmacy-based um, testing. We've talked about self-testing. We've talked about PrEP, simple community engagement and education around that. That's lovely. So moving into the, 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 the takeaway that we want individuals to have, um, let's talk about building relationships. Um, so how can health departments and community-based um, organizations partner with pharmacies or pharmacists in order to kind of start these pharmacy-based testing um, innovations? I think the biggest thing here is I've been able to be a part of our uh, Ryan White Planning Council. Um, in some of our other communities, my colleagues um, in my role with ASP Cares in the other states, they're part of those councils. And then Dallas is a fast track city. Uh, and so um, several of our community liaisons attend the meetings and, and are part of the, the fast track movement. So those type of things are really important um, that are happening um, so that you get a voice. You get to really meet everybody at the health department. Uh, we just passed a syringe service um, laws here in Oklahoma, a safe uh, syringe exchange program here that we're going to be starting to implement. And um, the health department has reached out to me and is trying to figure out ways that 
we can help be a part of the solution. Um, I guess when the laws were passed, uh, funding wasn't really available to purchase the needles for the needle exchange. Um, and so they're trying to figure out ways and where are drop off places and how is that safe and who's going to be able to do that. And um, pharmacies, you know, we take expired medication, we do um, take a lot of that stuff. And so we can be a great resource within the community. And so I think if there are those opportunities with planning councils, with fast track cities, um, local cooperatives, uh, with the different CBOs, taking advantage of those things is super important and you know, having a role at the table. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Um, and I don't want to forget about you, um, <laughs> Guillermo. <laughs> I know you've been sitting there. Um, <laughs> Amazingly, um, I'm really intrigued with the level of care that you are able to provide to the people um, that you serve. How do you feel that'll play into building relationships with community oh, um, community partners? Well, um, I think just getting to know Guillermo, you know, yeah. and what he does with that one on one with each person, that special touch that he has. I mean, and I mean, I, I pretty much have a good memory, you know, with, like with people, like their faces, the voice and everything. So like, you know, you get to know them pretty well, like easily when you talk to them. And okay. like, you know, like you try to like build a conversation with them so it can feel like, you know, they're like in a safe environment. Like we're not going to judge them or like do anything like that. Uh -huh. Yeah. And we really work um, in our system. Guillermo's put a really good um, kind of fields in place in our um, software system to make sure that we're calling folks by their correct name. Obviously, you're still going to have their birth name and those type of things legally that we have to have, but we really try hard on not in our notes and that to keep track. And we have a couple of people that have been going through transitioning and they try on different names and yeah. we get that, you know, and so we, um, you know, kind of just follow along and make sure that we're using the correct pronouns as much as we can and those type of things. And then that word of mouth, like, hey, I went to this pharmacy and, you know, they called me they, and that's, that's so important to me. And, you know, then you tell your friends and that word of mouth catches on. Awesome. Yeah, um, definitely in my experience. Um, I don't know if I've, I, I think I shared this with Cher before, but I've been a pharmacy technician since like 2013. So um, just navigating from working in retail um, at a large retailer to moving into specialty pharmacy. Um, so I know what it looks like to have more of a robotic sense of care that you do in those large retail settings to something as intimate as to what you guys are doing here. So um, I know the importance of that. So it's really appreciative that people are able to experience and see how much work goes into working in the pharmacy, because that's really important. Um, so with all of that being said, as pharmacy staff, what expectations would you guys have of those partnerships? Um, I mean, you know, we can't do our job without them, um, you know, I mean, it still takes prescriptions to keep our doors open um, and finding solutions for them. Um, we really, by able to, to tap into our patient care coordinators that are on the back end, as Brent said, to find ways to enroll them into programs to where they can't pay for their medications. Insurance is weird. Insurance is complicated. Um, we just have Medicaid expansion now here in Oklahoma and that's good and bad on some areas and it's changed for people. And so when they go through those changes and, and as they're moving in and out to of not qualifying for Ryan White anymore and now having to have an insurance plan and paying for prescriptions and co-pays and um, navigating that whole system is challenging. Um, and so we're another resource for that, which is really great to be able to offer. Awesome. Um, I'm gonna break away for a small moment to see if we have any questions or Okay. And going on within the chat. Okay, so actually we do have a question. Um, it says, what convinced the pharmacy to engage and agree to provide HIV tests to their clients? So that's come down from our ownership. Um, and that's really been um, something with the 340B programs. They hired um, my boss as the director of 340B, uh, Rex Green in Dallas in our corporate office at ASP Cares. And um, a lot of our team members are living with HIV, they're on PrEP, um, they're part of the LGBT community, and um, it, it's been a passion of all of ours collectively. Every one of us has a story and a connection um, for working with um, the LGBT community and HIV uh, or PrEP and PEP. And 
um, that's kind of how we all have come together. Everybody has their own story and have always been a part of the community. And so figuring out ways to fill in gaps, uh, reduce barriers, that's just been something that we've, we've been able to do. The pharmacy didn't start out that way, but with bringing on um, that, that, that member of our team who then built the whole 340B program, and really put an emphasis on the LGBT community and those services, it's been wonderful. And it's been widely accepted across the board on all of our ISP care pharmacies. Um, and it's been great to see when you go to any of our, our corporate meetings, we're the most diverse group on the planet. And it's wonderful to see so many different cultures come together, so many different lifestyles come together. It's, it's wonderful to be a part of such a diverse community. And I think that's what helps us tremendously to, um, meet everybody where they are. Awesome, that's amazing. Um, what were some of your initial challenges with um, ultimately starting with that direction? I think um, ASP Cares has had a couple name changes and rebranding. Um, we started out as American Star Pharmacy and American Specialty Pharmacy and then kind of moving to the ASP Cares. Um, and so, the, the rebrands um, on a small budget have been always marketing. You always wish you had more marketing dollars. Um, so that's always a challenge. And so putting community liaisons in place, that's kind of our role to go out and make those connections. And so we're able to meet on a larger scale with providers one-on-one -on -one, um, and help, you know, um, help with their solutions on what they have for their needs for their patients and put the connections together for the programs. Um, but it is building that up. And so now we've been able to go in and sponsor different things. So in, um, we sponsor a lot of different pride events across the country. Um, we sponsor galas and, and things and golf tournaments. Um, so we're, we're, we're heavily involved with our partners and it's a true partnership. It's not just that we're the pharmacy here on the Southern end. We really um, work with them and, and see them on a regular basis, which is great. So um, for our pharmacist and our pharmacy um, technician, um, I know we talked a lot about testing and things of that nature. You guys gave us an amazing explanation of your workflow from start to finish. What does it look like for you to implement testing into that particular workflow? Um, do you think it's possible? What challenges do you think you may um, come across, if any, just expand on what that may look like with your current flow? We actually have a waiting area up front that was is perfectly fit for that, um, and it's it's pretty open. And you could come in, and and there would be like a, a section of privacy for you. And if you wanted to do that, to know within fifteen or thirty minutes on your test, um, it, the challenges are is is basically the privacy. So like you, you might be there with a stranger that might actually see your result. So like we do have. Um, uh, the thing that's coming up uh, with the new place that we're going to where it's all going to be separated. So that's coming up very soon. So right now, uh, our lobby is, uh, is it's kind of, it's not overly uh, like a, a crowded, I would say. So you're usually up there by yourself. So uh, the chance of that happening is very low, but I, I would say that um, the privacy thing is something that you would, if you're extremely worried about that, then wait till we get to the new facility and then we'll, you can just come in at any time and basically not have to worry about that. And that, that would be the only challenge. Other than that, uh, basically it's, it's just a, a stepwise per approach and we're always available to help you. And that is one of the things we, we always try to, to look at because as you get more specialized in the LGBT community or specializing, like you said, in these medications with HIV, PEP and PrEP, then is somebody that's coming here for oncology medication, do they have this assumption that you see their car in our parking lot and they're coming in, then do they have HIV? And, and I mean, that's kind of, you know, the CBOs have gone through that for years. Like somebody's coming in to, to meet with them about one of their fundraising galas. And, you know, they're like, oh, I can't show up because you do testing here. And people might think, um, you know, that stigma and, and in a small town, I mean, even though Oklahoma City is, is obviously a true metropolitan area, just the rule and the stigma in the South, it's tough um, to try to get through those barriers. Um, when I was at the AIDS Care Fund, we had a, a, a huge gala that we did that was similar to um, the small scale version of an AMFAR gala, um, but it was the largest fundraising event in our entire state and every who's who attended it. We had all of the athletes, everybody wanted to be a part of it, but um, when we were looking at real estate to expand our offices, um, the 
committee members really cautioned that we don't put it near one of our existing CBOs because they didn't want people to think that if they saw their car in the parking lot coming in for, you know, an auction meeting that they were going to be signaled out and, and somebody might think something about what was going on with their health. And it's sad that that's something that, that everybody still, you know, assumes or worries about and that stigma is tough. It's, it's very, very hard here in Oklahoma. And I know it is across the South. Yeah. Definitely. Um, that stigma is a very important piece. And that's the importance or um, a lot of the carrying grace for the innovation of pharmacy based testing is that people have so much access to pharmacies, um, you can go into a pharmacy and not necessarily yeah. go in to get tested. So um, you guys have a perfect opportunity or the perfect space for people to initiate in testing in a less stigmatizing environment. So this is um, really groundbreaking and really <laughs> innovative <laughs> towards what's next for HIV testing. So I really appreciate you guys sharing everything that you have today. Um, I kind of want to open the floor for any questions and answers that we may have um, in the chat. Um, so I'll go over here. So um, we have a question that says, um, do you guys refer to HIV testing um, in our, I'm sorry. So um, it says, do y'all refer um, to HIV testing and our PrEP clients that are in the pharmacy for something else not related to HIV or PrEP or with the next spectrum? If so, how do you go about that? So I guess I'm reading this that they're here for something else and mm -hmm. that they may need. I says that, yeah, we have stuff um, and pamphlets and, and different um, things around um, that have um, a lot more information that we can refer folks to. So they might be coming in to pick up, you know, diabetes injection medication or something like that. And then they can see that we also have condoms out. We have, you know, opportunities and, and information. We've got a, a poster up right now in our um, window talking about the pride event that's coming up next weekend in Oklahoma City. So um, definitely um, our materials are around for folks. And I go out and do different outreach events at, at, at schools. We've started to implement um, one of our um, clinics actually is doing outreach and hosting prep fairs at the different colleges across Oklahoma. And um, they usually work with student services or if there is like an LGBT um, committee or, or, or group on campus, our student health services. And so we actually um, bring our tables and set up just information out in the, you know, the lobby area, and then they can drop in and schedule a time to meet. And they actually is a provider in the back in one of the counselor's offices, and they can go in and, and do a, a free HIV test, get the results um, right then. And then they, the provider can talk to them about PrEP, um, and they will do all of the, everything that needs to be taken, the lab work and that they have in a, um, uh, a compact in, in um, option to where they can take that out uh, into the community and then bring all the lab stuff back to the office and have that all done. And then, you know, we take down as much information with the client. I let them know that, you know, they're part of our, our 340B program and that somebody from the pharmacy will be calling them about um, ways to help them get them enrolled into our program so that there's not any out-of-pocket costs for them. And it's been so widely accepted. Um, I was just at a community college yesterday. We were at a private university the week before. And then now one of the state schools lost their health clinic. And so the um, clinic is now doing every Friday's walk-in at the uh, Women's Center and LGBTQ Center. And um, it's predominantly for women's health services um, and LGBTQ services. But um, they're seeing the need that since the entire health clinic uh, closed down that they might need to do some strep tests some flu shots some flu tests and some other things because um, that is missing in that area so um, it's been great to see and a lot of these are student led programs and what used to happen when we started doing these outreach events um, we, you know you didn't get a lot of folks coming and talking about like they were at this or going to it and as this younger generation is more in touch with their sexual health and and what they they're they're needing and doing you'll see entire groups come in and then they start calling each other going yeah i'm over here i'm getting my free hiv test you need to come down come on yeah and tell so and so and so and so and so and so we're all coming and getting our hiv test and you see like these long-term testers all sitting around that have been doing this for 30 years are like wait, they're talking about it. Um, and that's amazing. And, and so now it's like, we're the ones that are the problem and have to uh, evolve and get with it. So um, it's great to see. And those have been 
wonderful outreach events that are really paying off and getting out to the young folks. And for those of you that don't know, Oklahoma is um, an abstinence only based curriculum in our school districts. So um, there's not any actual LGBTQ health um, that is ever discussed. And honestly, you just really are told not to kiss a boy because you don't want to get pregnant. So that's where we are. So there's a lot of things. Once people leave high school, uh, the college education becomes very important. Those are amazing services. <laughs> Crazy. Uh, absolutely amazing that you guys are able to make those type of um, connections. Someone in the chat said, same here in Florida, the struggle. <laughs> oh, wow. It's unbelievable that we're in 2021 and we're still teaching abstinence-based only curriculum. I actually went to one of the groups that was over that and they were really excited because teen pregnancy went down. And I think that is a wonderful thing that that um, unwed teen pregnancy numbers went down, but that I pulled up the state health department records on chlamydia, gonorrhea and syphilis uh, for that same age group. But I was like, so <laughs> <laughs> still some things we need to work on education wise uh, because those numbers went up. So. Okay, we have another question in the chat um, um, that says, are there any special trainings the pharmacy was required to complete prior to providing um, this service? And by this service, I'm assuming they're talking about um, the, the HIV testing. And also, is the testing free? Uh, testing is between $25 and $30. And, the, um, and there, there is uh, information about it that we researched, but there's no curriculum involved with it. Um, so we just became very familiar with it. Um, before our hand and then um, there, there was no like school-based approach with that. Yeah on the pharmacy side there's not any real curriculum but um, obviously we we still as a, as a company provide things and then um, there's there's some of those trainings that we work through and, and can get them enrolled in um, the different um, testing opportunities and that and obviously making sure you know that um, those things are being reported correctly to the health department and those things so we do follow all of those guidelines. Um, our next question says, what interaction does your testing program have with the state health department? Does the health department provide supplies or impose reporting requirements? The reporting requirements are imposed um, across the board. The only organization in the state that can that can opt out of that are the tribes. Um, the sovereign nations um, do not have to report, but all other numbers have to be reported to the health department. Um, and... Um, we do not, our CBOs do, um, and that's typically the qualifier here for them to be eligible to be a 340B covered entity is that they are receiving those services or are receiving um, funding from the health department's um, section 318 funding from the CDC. And so all of the CBOs that we work with um, have all of that. Um, our next question says, do you also refer for STDs? Oh yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, um, we also have another comment that says that the presentation was amazing um, and they want to know how they can transfer prescriptions to you guys. Oh, well, hey, absolutely. That's why it's Guillermo right here. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, we call them and uh, whatever. I mean, if they have a local pharmacy, we give them a call and then uh, I give that to Brent so we can get the prescriptions from that pharmacy. Yeah. We will get you our, what's our phone number here? 405-607-3995. It says 0995. 3995. Mm -hmm. Three. Awesome. And I'll pop that in the chat for them. <laughs> awesome. Um, and one of our final questions that we do have is, do you have other pharmacies that can help individuals that are in other states? Um, if so, um, how can they be contacted? Yeah, so we have a couple opportunities there. Um, ASPcares.com is the website for ASP Cares. So you can see um, it has locations up there and you can see the different uh, pharmacies that we work with. Uh, um, also, we have sister pharmacies that we contract with. So mm -hmm. we have um, Epic Pharmacy here in Oklahoma um, that can take other insurances and, and, and navigate around some things that we might have restrictions for and they do compounding. Um, we also work with Couch Pharmacy in Tulsa, Vital Care in Houston, and Woodlakes Pharmacy in Conroe, Texas. So we have um, some other contract pharmacies that um, are part of our larger scale partnership that we have with our 340B um, 
third party administrator, which is a lead analytics group. Um, so those are opportunities. Um, we're always looking for new pharmacies that want to contract and you might be looking for a third party administrator. We can always help with that. Um, and then just general, we have a 1-800 number as well. And that is our, now I've got to lose my 1-800 number. Um, it's 1-800-950-2919. Uh, and um, that will ring um, to our corporate office and then folks wanting additional information or need to be transferred to another state. Also, um, we have different licenses in some of our different um, pharmacies. So just we can ship and, and, and provide services in other states. Okay, thank you so much. Um, and one of our final questions is, how are you as a 340B pharmacy different than a retail pharmacy? So we're able to order the medication at a discount, the 340B uh, discounted prices, and, and those are ordered on the covered entity's account. So um, our third party administrator actually um, operates to take care of those costs and then works on a whole reimbursement um, program. But there are um, some dispensing fees and admin fees and that, but it's, it's a wonderful program because the medications are ordered at a discounted 340B rate. Um, and then if the person has insurance, the insurance reimburses at the full retail. So there is that discount um, in between that then the savings get passed back on to the covered entity. And then the covered entity usually uses those, at least within this program, they're using those obviously to hire more staff for equipment and those services, but they also pass along those savings to their uninsured patients, their undocumented patients, and they're able to provide and, and apply those to uh, lab costs, their visit time, um, any other services that they might need, um, which is wonderful. So it's, it's, it's a, a kind of almost like the, the insured pay it forward for the uninsured. Good old 340B. But we also operate as a retail. So um, folks can still walk in and fill a prescription here any day, any prescription. Um, I'm so we're, we're more like a community pharmacy where we're your pharmacy here in the community. We um, do have the 340B contracts and partnerships, but we're also a regular pharmacy and you can come in anytime. Thank you guys so much. So um, we, we've learned so much um, as it relates to this. Um, and we've had some great questions about what you guys do, what, what you offer and everything. So um, from, from everybody who, um, who's a panelist, um, if the participants have to walk away with one thing from today, what should it be? For me, I would say compassion. I mean, it's really about doing what's best for the patient. And, and I'm, I'm so pleased that I work for a company that always has that mantra and follows it. And you just do what's needed. Um, and a lot of times if that means we have to transfer that prescription away um, to another pharmacy, we're gonna do that because it's the right thing to do, but yet still help that other pharmacy figure it all out and get that person to you know, not have a cost, a, a cost or at least a very little out-of-pocket cost. So we just always try to do what's best for the patients and put them first. And that's, I think, um, sometimes you lose that in a, in a, in a larger environment. Um, and so I'm so blessed to, to be here and to be a part of something that's that true partnership and putting patients first. Right, for me, it's access. Um, most of the time when you're calling a pharmacy, you're listening to cold music or you're yes. listening to <laughs> so You can't talk to somebody. If you call us, more than likely, somebody's gonna answer your phone immediately. We'll answer your questions even if they're if you're not part of our pharmacy. Because that's, that's the number one thing we wanna do is, First, we're going to create the relationship with the access. And if you trust us, then have us fill your prescriptions for you, and then we can answer your questions anytime. So um, uh, that that is probably the number one thing for us. Anything yeah. else? Do you have anything else to add? Well, with me, since uh, I'm pretty much a shy person, you know, I'm like judge-free zone right here, you know. <laughs> I think, it's, yeah. I think it's great for his own, his, his customer relationships are really great because he can uh, speak Spanish and English. And so basically any population that comes in, we usually can uh, help them in, in, in their own language, which is great. I know he's shy here, but you hear him talking yeah, on the phone great. and he's just talking to everybody. How you doing? How's, the, how's your mom? You know, knows the whole thing. So it's good. <laughs> well, so he's very personable. Yes. <laughs> Love it. Love it. Um, 
that's pretty much all of the questions that I have. Um, as a collective, um, do you guys have anything that you want to add or that you want people to know about what you do as it relates to pharmacy-based HIV testing? Um, well, uh, it's just one of those things that it's, it's just the community as they learn about it and uh, don't be afraid to ask questions. Uh, we'll, we'll answer as well as we can. Um, usually we, we've got all the answers that, uh, that are going to satisfy your curiosity. If you do have curiosity about it, then just get in contact with us and, and we'll, we'll, let, we'll fill you in on things that you want to know. And I think Brett was right in the beginning where he said, don't be afraid. Um, you know, HIV is no longer a death sentence. There are wonderful medications out there and, you know, you can get to an undetectable level. Uh, you don't have to change your behaviors once you get to this undetectable level. And I think that's a big thing that, that people worry about, um, you know, that it, whatever put them at risk, do they have to change that? Um, you know, and I think, I think that's great talking about PrEP, knowing that PEP is an option, um, especially here, um, unless you have an occupational, um, you know, stick or, or, you know, a transmission, a lot of times the emergency rooms aren't going to do that. The Ryan White Clinic isn't going to help you. It has to be occupational. And so, um, you know, that's a, an opportunity to come in and get tested and get on within 72 hours of a possible exposure. And we definitely, you know, know the urgency of that. And we have people could come in an hour 70 um, and that, you know, we're scrambling to get them hurry. Uh, and we do, um, you know, and that can be on a Sunday night and we're, we're like, oh, okay. You know, and we'll come in and we'll open and we'll do what we need to do. And um, we've got one, um, one of our favorite stories that we tell in, in um, Corpus Christi was there was an emergency PEP issue in Corpus Christi and my boss had to call the pharmacist and she was like, well, I'm at the beach. Um, I don't mind going and open up the pharmacy and meeting him there if I can meet him there you know, at this time. And, and that she goes, but I don't have time to drive home and I'm in my swimsuit. He goes, that's okay. Just go open it up in your swimsuit. That's so sure enough. There's the pharmacist <laughs> in her swimsuit cover up, you know, processing that. But that meant the world to that patient. Um, and and just the the positive that reinforcements and, and the benefits that come back from that. And then the word of mouth that, that that's a story that, you know, everyone in our whole company knows and um, half of Corpus Christi knows, you know, which is great. Love it. <laughs> um, I appreciate you guys being a part of this. Um, along with everything else that we've learned, what I feel like you guys have done is created this sense of intimacy around what pharmacies do and what they provide. And a lot of individuals on the outside looking in don't know how gentle this care is and how important that is um, when the goal is to ultimately partner and do HIV testing. Um, Community-based organizations may have reservations to think that, oh, pharmacies are so busy, they won't be personable. They won't be able to direct people to where they need to go. So you guys have done a great job in creating that visibility, um, educating people on what pharmacy is and letting them know that you care for clients just as much as they do. So. I really appreciate you guys joining us today. Um, I appreciate all of our attendees for asking amazing questions. Um, and that's it. So thank you guys so much. Thank, oh, you. thank you. We appreciate it. And anytime anybody needs to reach out, they can and we can help them. And if they're looking to put a pharmacy in their clinic or start a clinic and aren't really sure, we've done all of, all of our sister companies and that we're part of a larger group and part of a hospital network as well. So um, if we can't answer it, we're going to find the answer and find the solution. Um, so, you know, use us as a resource. We'd be happy to help. I can put my information in the chat, my email address too, if that helps. Yeah. So people can contact you. Yeah. Well, if I can read with my bifocals and do this right. <laughs> Telling you, getting old sucks. That goes to everyone. Okay. So that is um, C Golding at ASPCares.com. Awesome. Thank you so much, Cher, Brent, and Guillermo. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much. We had fun. All right. I had fun too. Thank you guys. Bye bye. Okay, bye.